65 years ago, a new era began in the life of our country. On the 2nd of June, 1953, a beautiful 27-year-old woman was crowned Queen Elizabeth II. It felt like a new era because there was also a kind of sense of romance about it. All the years of privation had passed, and this was a moment to celebrate. The coronation was momentous for another reason. This ancient ceremony was being filmed for the first time. 1953 marked a historic moment when film and television brought monarch and people closer together for the first time. It was as if we, the viewers, were actually in Westminster Abbey witnessing the coronation with our own eyes. It was the moment that the Queen became our Queen. Not only that, this was also the era of home movies, even for the royal family. The Queen's passion for filmmaking caught on across the nation. People filmed their own local celebrations, creating priceless records of an historic day. We've scoured the archives across the UK to find the very best footage. As you'll see, the joy of this thing just shines out of the screen. To celebrate the 65th anniversary of the coronation, we're going to see these amazing films and hear from royal insiders who played a crucial role on the Queen's big day. I remember how glamorous the Queen looked this radiant figure. The Queen turned round and said, shall we go, girls? <laughs> 1953 marked the beginning of a new and closer relationship with the royal family. This was the Queen's coronation, but it was also the people's coronation. In my eyes, it was wonderful and the most spectacular day of my life. The coronation of Queen Elizabeth II was a day of national celebration. A moment of glorious technicolor after the dark days of the Second World War. The romance of the coronation captured everyone's imagination. Actor Michael Crawford was 11 years old at the time. This brought our country together. It's very stirring and moving and brings out great pride. This is ours. It's our queen. Michael was so excited that he made his own scrapbook, painstakingly recording each coronation detail. Everything I could find in the newspapers, I cut out. Beautifully done. It was obviously a passion. Look, that is pure Hollywood, really. But that is my favorite photo. This was the beginning of this amazing dedication of her life to this country. But this moment of national euphoria followed a moment of profound national sorrow. The heart of the nation stops. The flags lower in tribute as the news spreads. The king is dead. King George VI's unexpected death, at the age of only 56, sent shockwaves across Britain and the Commonwealth. The news was greeted with dismay, as far away as Trinidad in the Caribbean, where broadcaster Trevor MacDonald grew up. I remember the day the king died, and um, it was announced in a fairly kind of solemn but abrupt way. And that was the end of the day. And I don't remember how many days we were off school, but that was a moment of great, great, great sadness. Britain and its Commonwealth were in mourning, but few felt the loss more keenly than Princess Elizabeth. She'd always been devoted. The king is laid to rest, and the majesty of death ends with a family beginning its life anew. A young queen takes over the burden of monarchy. At the age of only 25, Elizabeth had to cope with new responsibilities. God save the Queen. There was this young English princess who was taking on what everybody thought was the enormous task of being Queen of England and also of the Commonwealth. And that struck a deep, deep chord with people. Everyone wanted a sunny day for the coronation, and after consulting meteorologists, it was decided that June 2nd, 1953, was the best bet. As soon as the date was announced, coronation fever began to grip the country. Actress Alison Stedman was six years old at the time. I grew up in Anfield, in Liverpool. It was a small house, but we had three bedrooms, a um, little garden at the back, where my dad grew vegetables and rhubarb. There was still rationing when I was a child. There was a lot of bomb sites. 
The build-up to the coronation was so exciting. I probably would say it was one of the happiest periods of my childhood. Excitement was also sky-high in Bethnal Green in London's East End, where entertainer Len Goodman lived with his family. Back then, they didn't make such a hullabaloo about things, but everywhere there was this buzz of, of excitement, of anticipation. The Queen's coronation was a big deal. Organisers had some was littered with bombsites. Materials were in short supply. Even so, every detail had to be meticulously planned. Models were built to show the Gold State coach would travel from Buckingham Palace to Westminster Abbey. English monarchs had been crowned here since 1066. The Abbey normally held 3,000 people. This time, it would have to accommodate 8,000 guests. At the beginning of 1953, in fact, literally on the 1st of January, Westminster Abbey closed its doors to visitors so that it could transform itself, the greatest transformation in its history. Railway tracks were laid down here so that materials and supplies could be whisked into the Abbey. And bit by bit, scaffolding grew up these pillars here. Eventually, there'd be huge banks of sitting here. But interestingly, of the whole area of the Abbey, all attention was actually focused on this tiny area here, the intense, sacred focal point of the coronation itself. This is where the coronation chair sat, facing the altar. The coronation was an ancient religious ceremony. How much of it people should see was a big issue for everyone involved, especially for the people at the heart of the ceremony, like the Queen's Maids of Honour, was the advent of television. There was a lot of argument about whether the coronation should be shown on the television or not. And there were two camps. In one camp were establishment bigwigs, including the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Prime Minister, Winston Churchill. They wanted a private ceremony. In the opposing camp was a moderniser, the Duke of Edinburgh. He was in a powerful position, both as the Queen's husband but also as the chair of the commission overseeing coronation preparations. The forces of modernity, led and championed by the Duke of Edinburgh, were saying, bring the cameras in. We have to shed light on this. We have to share this celebration, not just with Britain, but with the rest of the world. The Duke of Edinburgh understood the power of film and television. In 1951, he'd even appeared on the big screen himself. What do you want to see me about? God. He'd used the power of film to campaign for playing fields for inner-city children. Well, come on. What is it? For months, the arguments raged, but eventually, the Duke won the day. The coronation ceremony would be filmed for the first time. It was nothing less than a royal revolution. The Queen's coronation was one of the most dazzling events ever staged. You know, seeing a crown with those jewels on and those clothes and the golden carriage, it was... ..the sense that these were exciting times. Newspapers called it the new Elizabethan age. We were looking to the future. We had this, you know, lovely princess who was now becoming a queen. So life was going to be good. This new age would start with a burst of pageantry. Each detail was painstakingly rehearsed. The Queen's young cousin, Prince Michael of Kent, took part in the practice runs for the big day. The, the coronation was the most extraordinarily exciting thing, especially for a small boy of about 10 or whatever I was. Um, and uh, when we all knew the coronation was going to take place, I was at prep school in those days, and we talked about coronagates and how splendid it was and what fun it was. The rehearsals were splendid because I had to walk, as did most of my family, the whole length of Westminster Abbey to get to our pews. And, of course, to start with, the rehearsals were in ordinary clothes. And then as you got nearer to the day, you find yourself in all your finery. Now, I had a very, very smart kilt outfit. Rehearsals were daunting, especially now the ceremony was being filmed. It was particularly nerve-wracking for the six young women who'd been chosen to accompany the Queen, her maids of honour. In some ways, it felt quite frightening, but as the time got nearer, 
I became even more frightened when I discovered it was going to be filmed worldwide. We kept thinking, wouldn't it be awful if you fell over or tripped or um, fainted was a big fear. Banks of cameras would film the Queen's every move. One of the cameramen in Westminster Abbey was 27-year-old Sidney Samuelson. Sidney had a critical mission. He had to capture the precise moment that the Queen was crowned. You must have been aware that you were at the centre of the most important event of that day, that year. Although I was relatively young, it was the most marvellous assignment of my life. I was in a soundproof booth to keep the noise of the cameras inside the booth and not interfering with the coronation. The noise of this camera was such that you had to be in a soundproof box. Would you like to hear the noise? Yeah, I'd love to. Let's hear it. What yeah, do you think of that? I, I, yeah, I see. It's not, it's not ideal, is it? Every cameraman in the Abbey, they'd never done anything like it before in their lives. Mm. Film footage shot inside the Abbey would be shown not just in Britain, but all over the world. People throughout the Commonwealth would see the coronation. Carnival, celebrate the occasion, Elizabeth coronation. Trinidad was a colony. And it was very, very British. And news of the impending coronation was a time of great, great anticipation. The national anthem was being played everywhere. People in England referred to the Queen of England. Um, we thought she was our Queen. If the Queen was important to the Commonwealth, then the Commonwealth was equally important to the Queen. She even had its floral emblems sewn into her coronation dress. The public were fascinated by the details of the Queen's coronation wardrobe. On top of her gown, she'd wear a special robe of estate, made of velvet and trimmed with ermine. Embroiderers from the Royal School of Needlework sewed elaborate designs onto the robe with real golden thread. This is a sample that was done in 1953, and the design is uh, peace and plenty. So we have wheat ears, wheat leaves, olives, olive stem and olive leaves as well. I suppose when cameras from above could look down on that sort of long, great, yeah, it sort of the royal purple, it must have looked amazing. Twelve embroiderers worked on the robe in shifts, seven days a week. It took them 3,500 hours to complete. So, Mandy, can I, can I have a go? Do you yes, to definitely. Do or... What I've chosen for you to have a go at is actually, we call it cut work. Yep. Yeah, First of all, if you pull the gold right the way down to the bottom, there you are. So it sits snugly on the, the velvet. And then take your needle down and position the other side. And down it goes. Once you've been doing it quite a while, the needle will come up exactly where you want. Oh, I'm not going to pretend I'm not thrilled with that, Mandy. Yeah, it was good, actually. That yeah, you got a... it in the right yeah. place first time. <laughs> <laughs> so, there's an embroiderer in you. <laughs> the filming of the coronation created additional challenges. The Queen had to look good on camera for the millions watching. Top makeup designer Thelma Holland was brought in to help. My mother had to get samples of the red robe that the Queen was going to wear on her way to the Abbey and the purple robe of estate that she was going to wear after the coronation and produce the makeup and much more important than anything else, the lipstick that she was going to wear, which would clash with neither and match both too dark and she would have looked almost ghoulish, uh, too red and it would then have clashed with the purple coronation robe after the event. So it had to be, it was a very, very fine balance. And this was the famous sum through something like 12 different trials with the cosmetic chemist to find exactly the right tone. But I think she did a good job. And if you look at the color films of the time, um, there doesn't appear to be a clash. <laughs> Most people would be watching, not in glorious technicolor, but in grainy black and white. In the 14 months leading up to the coronation, the number of TV licenses rocketed by a million. The age of mass television had dawned. We were the only home in the street that had a television. It was purchased specially for the coronation. I think it was a 14 inch and it had two knobs. One was the off and on. And I don't think we ever discovered what the other knob was for. It was, oh no, don't touch that knob. Don't touch that. And you've got this terrible, grainy picture. You know, like you're looking through a fog. 
There's nothing now that's a gadget or whatever that would equal the excitement of this television coming in to our house. Other newfangled devices were capturing the imagination. As Coronation Day approached, home movie cameras were all the rage. People began filming the build-up to their local celebrations. And there now exists a fabulous archive of films from up and down the country. I've looked at scores of them, and I think this one from Aberfan and Merthyr Vale in Wales is my favourite. It just has such an exuberance about it, it's such eccentricity. I mean, in some places, it's, it's just plain odd. But apart from anything else, it, the heart of the thing just shines through. It's wonderful. The Welsh mining village of Aberfan has had more than its fair share of tragedy. In 1966, the village suffered a terrible disaster when a primary school was engulfed by a huge landslide. More than a hundred children died. But the coronation film is a record of an earlier and happier time. Well, I think I might have found a couple of people who actually appear in the film. So I've come here to Aberfan to talk to Chris and Eileen, who are going to tell me a bit more about this place. But also, I really want to get the inside track on what exactly happened, what it was like on that wonderful day of celebrations back in 1953. I'll go for this. Hello. Hello. Are you Chris? I am. Hello. How do you do? I'm Alexander. Thank you. Lovely to meet you. So why do you think everyone was so excited? What was it that you were excited? Was it everybody coming together or was... Oh, it was lovely. And everybody decorated their windows and there was a competition for that. And everybody put flags up. And the comical thing was that we saw some really funny ladies. And in the middle of a couple of the lines, they put their big bloomers up. In the middle. Well, in the bunting? Yes. You'd have triangle, triangle, so, triangle, oh, yeah. bloomers, triangle, triangle. You'll never see And everybody used to be laughing. Yeah. And it was really funny, you know. We, we had a lot of fun. And there was the Queen. I was an attendant to the Queen. Our local farmer, Donald, he gave us the... Well, he drove the tractor and they decorated it beautifully. And we'd go around up a van on it. It was lovely. And what's so lovely is you've got this beautiful carriage yes. being driven by the tractor. Tractor. As we were going down through Aberfan, everybody would be out there, there'd be hundreds of people, and they'd be all clapping and cheering, and we'd be all waving. But I think that's, that's a lovely way community works, actually, because these celebrations were going on up and down the country, yes. so every different community had, had a kind of link to what was happening in Westminster yes. Abbey. No, it was lovely. It, you was like, felt if you were there anyway, weren't you, really? Yes. You, you felt if you were... If, you know, the yeah. only thing was missing was her. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> By June 1953, the build-up was over. The great day had arrived. Can you imagine what must have been going through the mind of this young 27-year-old woman on the 1st of June 1953, the coronation now just hours away? Because behind all the pomp and the pageantry was a very simple, very solemn ritual that would be enacted. It would mean that the young woman who walked into the abbey behind me would then emerge as Queen Elizabeth forsaking normal family life with her two young children, a young husband, and dedicating herself to country and Commonwealth. And as if that weren't enough, doing it in the most visible and public way imaginable. Millions waited with bated breath for a day of pageantry the like of which the world had never seen. Just like Christmas, but more so, really. It was like Christmas with knobs on. The 2nd of June, 1953, Coronation Day, had arrived. But not for the first time, or the last, the weather forecasters had got it wrong. Well, wouldn't you know it, the 2nd of June, 1953, dawned chilly and wet. But that was never going to dampen the spirits of the 30,000 people who'd camped out throughout the night in order to catch a glimpse of the Queen the next day. And then throughout the morning, hundreds of thousands of others flooded into London. Because by mid-morning, there were three million people here in central London to witness this event for themselves. And then kings and queens and 750 broadcasters were broadcasting in 39 languages to take the event global. For millions of children, the countdown was over. From the moment I woke in the morning, it was exciting. It was like, oh, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. You know, we want, we want the party, we want the games. You know, we want to watch it on television. One group of children had an extra reason to feel excited. Choristers from St Paul's Cathedral were singing in the coronation service. 
The boys would be in the abbey for seven long hours, with no chance even to nip to the loo. We were given sandwiches, and they were peanut, peanut butter and marmalade in the same sandwich. So hang on, and these were partly to, to yes. keep your pangs of hunger at bay, yes. and also somehow to, uh, to, keep, to, to block prevent you, block, block block you up. up. We're, we're, mind you, we, 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 had did, a we did have cast iron bladders in those days, I I'm, think. I'm yes. certain yeah. you did. <laughs> Scaffolding <laughs> pipes <laughs> came in very handy with our feeding, because, of course, we had skins. <laughs> of course, you just feed them down. We just dropped them down the scaffold. <laughs> you did. Yes, we oh, did. God. Yes, even you. And probably, he was meant John, to be head hey. boy. I'll have you know. <laughs> the coronation was now only a few hours away. In Buckingham Palace, the Queen was making her final preparations. Royal makeup designer Thelma Holland was with her in the palace. The Queen said to her, "It's such an important occasion for me that I would rather th that." least number of people should be fussing around me before I go off to the Abbey. Uh, do you think I'm capable of doing my own makeup? And my mother said to her, yes, ma'am, I'm sure you're perfectly capable of doing it. And the Queen then said to her, I would like you to be here just in case. She did her own makeup for the coronation. I think it was such a momentous occasion for, I mean, what after all was a young woman. And the idea that she had a moment to herself, on her own, um, would have been extremely important to her. By nine o'clock, coaches were assembling at Buckingham Palace to take the great and the good to Westminster Abbey, including Prime Minister Winston Churchill. The Queen's young cousin, Prince Michael of Kent, was waiting with his family at the palace. It was a foul day. It rained the entire day long. It was cold, it was miserable, it was wet. From our point of view, it was a, a, a wonderful opportunity to have a very large assembly of cousins who came from uh, all over Europe. My mother, Princess Marina, and my sister, Princess Alexandra, and my brother, the Duke of Kent, all four of us were in who were doing the street lining were imp very impressive because it was uh, it, it's quite a long way to us Abbey from uh, Buckingham Palace. There was an enormous crowd, and they had um, uh, periscopes, a lot of them, which were strange-looking devices, where you looked through a, a, a viewer, and it, you then went up, and there were just two mirrors, one there and one there, and you could look over the heads of the people in front of you and see what was going on. And so you had a forest of these rather strange-looking things, which were sticking out from the crowd. Three million spectators lined the coronation route. In the crowd was actor Michael Crawford, who was 11 years old at the time. Do you, yes. Do you remember that? I mean, so where did, yes. where did you watch the... We went to the Mall. Oh, so, you were there? Yes. Uh, just here. The foot of these steps yeah. on the Mall. Yeah. And you see thousands of soldiers, and it's the pageantry, of the, and the uniforms, the regalia, and the noise of horses walking mm. by, and people's kindness of, of helping kids to see it. Policemen were lifting them up and holding people, and there was, there was this extraordinary spirit as throngs of people on the streets of London strained for their first view of the Queen, millions more gathered in living rooms to watch the greatest live broadcast ever seen. All the kids were sitting on the floor. Then the, the very, my nan and all those oldie ones, they were in chairs, table, you know, sitting around. All the mums and the dads were standing there. There were people looking through the, through the doorway. So to millions of viewers in Great Britain and Western Europe, came pictures of a ceremony and a scene which they will never forget. It, it was mesmerising. The Queen's carriage was due to leave Buckingham Palace at 10.26am precisely. You can imagine the build-up, the excitement, a great deal of hustle and bustle and fiddling around and making sure things were put on the right way round. I remember how glamorous the Queen looked, this radiant figure. The Queen travelled to Westminster Abbey in the Gold State Coach. It weighed a mammoth four tonnes and had been used in every coronation since George IV's in 1821. The horses that were used to pull the coronation coach were eight greys, which came from the Royal Mews at Buckingham Palace, and I don't think there are very often occasions where eight greys for a coach 
You have to have as much, quite a, a bit of responsibility. I think it has any brakes, for example. And of course, my granddad, who was a bit of a lad, he would be doing a running commentary. He'd be giving us all the old, uh, oh yeah, well, the, the, of course, the coach, he'd go. Yeah, the coach, blimey. That coach had been around for 5,000 years and he'd give it all that, you know, he didn't know anything, really. And he'd have a bottle of beer, crown now. The coach, which through the centuries has borne six monarchs to their coronations, has never carried one more fitted for the tasks of sovereignty than she who now is to be crowned. Waiting at the entrance to Westminster Abbey were the six young women who had helped carry the Queen's coronation robes, the maids of honour. I was one of the ones to take her out of the carriage when she got to the Abbey, and um, she didn't appear to me to be in the least bit worried. The Queen turned round and said, Shall we go, girls? <laughs> just dazzling. The colours were so beautiful, mainly scarlet and, of course, white for the ermine and women had a wall, had their best jewellery on and tiaras and um, beautiful music. And whenever I hear that music, I feel, you know, pricking in the eyes and catching in the throat. The only time we were separated was when she was anointed. She went and sat alone in the chair. Anointment was the spiritual heart of the coronation. This sacred ritual dated back 3,000 years. The monarch's head, hands and chest would be crossed with holy oil. The anointing was so sacred that the cameras were not allowed to film it. And here, in the most mysterious of the rites of coronation, the archbishop anoints her with holy oil and consecrates her to her great office. A gold canopy was held above the queen, shielding her from view. To me, it was incredibly moving because she was giving up her life. She looked vulnerable and young, and one felt that she was taking on a huge burden. Once they'd done that, they put on her robes again, and then the crowning took place. Filming the crucial moment when the crown was placed upon the queen's head was the shot assigned to cameraman Sidney Samuelson. The last and grandest symbol of all to see. I knew that that was the key shot, so I prepared for it. And I wound up the, both springs to their maximum. When I got to the end of this, it was fully wound, just before I heard zzzz, the spring broke. Oh, the God. only time in my whole experience yeah. I ever had a spring go it was, was in the Abbey on Coronation Day. Isn't that ridiculous? Down on the floor of the Abbey, trouble was also brewing for the maids of honour. One of my friends, Anglin Connor, she felt very faint. Uh, I felt something moving against my back, and I thought, goodness, what's happening here? Then I realised Anne was slipping down. We wore long gloves, and we had smelling salts um, concealed so that you could just pop them if you felt you were going to faint. So she was lifted up by the others and supported, and soon after that we went into the vestry where the archbishop produced a bottle of brandy, and Anne had a little swig. <laughs> he said, this will do you good. Meanwhile, cameraman Sidney Samuelson was trying to save the day. There was no way I could repair a spring, but I had brought a spare camera body and I just managed to get it all fixed and the door closed and I switched on and I got the shot that they wanted. The climax of the ceremony has arrived when the Archbishop gently sets this splendid emblem on the Queen's head. Oh, here we go. Oh, now, now we're cooking on gas. Yes. Oh, everybody would go into a hush now. Here comes the crown. 
straight or up he goes. Bentley, Bentley. <laughs> And the trumpets sound. Among the lay lords, the first to declare himself is her own husband, Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. Rising, he kisses the Queen's cheek and touches the Queen's crown in token of his readiness to help her bear its burden. In 1953, however, there wasn't just one Queen being crowned, there were dozens. Replica coronation ceremonies were held in towns and villages across the country. In the Mud Queen. Now, Vance, there's so much to ask you about. <laughs> Tell me all about your coronation here in Blackburn in 1953. How did it, how did it come about? How were you chosen? They put, uh, they've collected all the names. Yeah. And the names of the kids that were for fairies and all the rest of it. And they put them in this big barrel. And then... It's like a sort of tombola, the all the names. <laughs> Christina's big day was captured in beautiful colour film. It's a record of the pride which Blackburn took in its royal celebrations. In the weeks leading up to the coronation, a local schoolmistress put Queen Christina and her entourage through their paces. What, what happened in the rehearsals? What were you taught? Everything. I taught you how to weave and... Show me your wave. That's the way. That's the I got it, have I got it right? Oh, no, you haven't got the... No, that's not nothing. Oh. oh, right, three. God, I'm not sure. I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't be queen. <laughs> Can't. And she had you waving. What else did she get you to do? Walking up the stairs. Huh. Yeah, what? I had to walk up the stairs regally. <laughs> <laughs> regally. So when it got to the day, I mean, were you... You must have been really nervous. Yeah, well, we're getting quite excited about it. Yeah. How many people were there? Oh, there were hundreds of and then this, this is the complete calculation. Oh, look at that. There it is. The townsfolk and good neighbours of Blackburn are desirous of having a queen to rule over them in matters of joy and festivity during her reign of office. Therefore, it is now appointed that she be crowned gala queen in the presence of her subjects who will pledge their loyal devotion, devotation and willing service. I could do with more of this <laughs> queen stuff. I hope you took them up, I hope you took them up on that. <laughs> You had become the queen, really, haven't you? <laughs> yes. You, your job was to go out and, and you now had to go yes. off and shake people's hands yeah. and... Uh, yes, the, yeah, the queen for a day. Blackburn's film shows how local communities shared in the national celebrations hundreds of miles away in London. The televising of the coronation helped to forge a new and closer relationship between the Queen and her people. I think us all sitting there and talking about it made you feel more a part of, 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 of the whole thing. But to all intents and purposes, I know we're sitting in E3, but we are watching Westminster Abbey. We're watching it. You know, we're there. Wonderful. With the official coronation over, Britain was about to have the most almighty celebration. She was a pretty young English rose. And to watch this new age come into being with the coronation of the Queen was a moment to celebrate. It was a wonderful day and a wonderful occasion and amazing to think we're here all these years later. The coronation of Queen Elizabeth II took a mammoth three hours. But by early afternoon, the ceremony was over. She was smiling like anything. She was thinking to herself, well, that's a job well done. I mean, she had every right to think that because she had done a wonderful job. And there was a moment where she takes off the crown, which weighs an absolute ton, and she put it on the table. And Prince Charles, who was then about four, came running across from the other side of the room, saw it lying there, and tried to pick it up. Luckily, a lady in waiting swiftly moved in, took it away from him, put it high up, because he could easily have dropped it. Now, to delight the thousands below, the Queen and her family step onto the balcony. And we went out on the balcony, and the cheering, I've never forgotten that. That was extraordinary. If you look to the right or the left, everybody was 
cheering and some people were crying with joy. I mean, there was a real kind of feeling of euphoria. We were all rejoicing. Coronation Day in Buckingham Palace had formally ended, but in the East End, the party was just beginning. Now look at this. Hey, hey. Look at this. Elizabeth Hour, 1953. That is the photograph of the kids in Bethnal Green just before we get sat down to the banquet. There's me, little Lenny boy, and the rest are just the street kids of our street. Prime Minister Winston Churchill had lifted sweet rationing in time for the coronation so children could tuck in to a sugary feast. We all had to sit down and then uh, son God saves the Queen uh, and then off we went with the food. And course after course, it was honestly. It was, it was like a tasting menu. <laughs> oh, salmon, sat up, yeah. Salmon sandwiches, our posh. Gorgeous. Coronation Day was drawing to a close in Britain, but on the other side of the Atlantic, anticipation was still building. At London Airport, Royal Air Force Canberras were warmed up and waiting for a five-hour transatlantic dash. Yes. 85 million Americans tuned in to watch the Queen being crowned. The coronation had become the world's first global event, enjoyed everywhere and preserved on film for all time. But it's back home where the memories of Coronation Day remain strongest. So tonight I'm staging my own world premiere. I'm showing the 1953 Aberfan coronation film so villagers can see it and enjoy it for the first time. Hi there. Hello. How are you doing? Welcome. Ah, oh, here's Mary. I'm here. I'm here. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've got such a treat for you. I don't know how many of you, if any of you, have seen this before, but this is a film that was shot here, right here in Aberfan, on the 2nd of June in 1953. As you'll see, the joy of this thing just shines out of the screen. Anyway, enjoy it, and uh, I'll speak to you all at the end. But thank you again so much for coming. The party that took place here in Aberfan was mirrored in communities across the UK. From Brighton to Blackburn, from Leicester to London, the whole nation joined in. There are over a hundred films of local coronation celebrations filmed in every corner of the UK. Taken together, they're a shared record of a unique day. <laughs> now, splendid, solemn and glorious though everything happening in Westminster Abbey was, it occurs to me that something even more magical was happening up and down the country. Communities were taking this as their signal just to fling their souls into something so joyous, unabashed joy, of a kind that you still feel the warmth emanating down the years. It's 65 years later now, and of course the world has changed. But one thing I've found up in Blackburn, here in Aberfan, is that that strong sense of community that was brought alive by events such as the coronation is still alive and strong. And that is surely something to celebrate. was the best bet. As soon as the date was announced, coronation fever began to grip the country. Actress Alison Stedman was six years old at the time. I grew up in Anfield, in Liverpool. It was a small house, but we had three bedrooms, a um, little garden at the back, where my dad grew vegetables and rhubarb. There was still rationing when I was a child. There was a lot of bomb sites. The build-up 
to the coronation was so exciting. I probably would say it was one of the happiest periods of my childhood. Excitement was also sky high in Bethnal Green in London's East End, where entertainer Len Goodman lived with his family. Back then, they didn't make such a hullabaloo about things, but everywhere there was this buzz of, of excitement, of anticipation. The Queen's coronation was a big deal. Organisers had